In the previous segment, we discussed Euclid's algorithm for determining the GCD of two positive integers. And we said that uh, the program is uh, simple, but we also said that it is possible to make mistakes. And therefore, it is a good idea to sort of do some cross checks later on to ensure that we did not make any mistakes. So that is what we are going to do in this segment. So basically, we are going to try and produce some kind of a correctness proof. Okay. So a correctness proof, uh, I guess, has two, two things it does. Okay. So it it sort of says that we have implemented the major ideas correctly. So that is we have implemented Euclid's theorem correctly, but we have not made any silly mistakes. Okay. So um, if the program just happens to be one statement after another without any loops, then we can visually check okay, because the loops really sort of confuse the issues. right? I mean the loops say oh in the previous iteration what happened in the iteration before that what happened and all of that. So we have to make sort of precise statements about what happens in each iteration. Okay? So therefore we need to be a little bit careful and we sort of need some special machinery for it. Okay? Okay, so how does the correctness proof of a program look like? So we need to prove that the program must terminate okay, because this is one way in which a program could do something wrong. Okay. So a program may go into an endless loop. So we do not want that. And we want that the program should give the correct answer when it terminates. So typically this is done by defining some, uh, something called a potential which, uh, which tells us that the program terminates. And then we also define something called the invariant which says that the program will sort of give the correct answer. So we are going to see these two things now. So invariants. So let us say that capital M and capital N are the values typed in by the user into the variables little m and little n. Then we would like to make the following claim just before and just after every iteration the values of the variables m and n might be different from iteration to iteration. Okay. However, GCD of what is in m and n is exactly the GCD of capital M capital N, which is the GCD of the numbers that we wanted. Okay. So this basically says that yes, you are allowed to do something to those values m and n, but we are not losing any information. So uh, hopefully the numbers are decreasing, but we are not losing any information. Okay? So that is what this statement says, so this claim, claim says. So such a claim which says that a certain property does not change due to, the, due to a loop iteration is called a loop invariant or sometimes just invariant. So now I am going to give a proof sketch of our invariant. Our invariant was that the GCD of the values contained in the variables m and n is equal to the GCD of capital M capital N the values typed by the user at the beginning. And that this holds at the beginning and end of every iteration. Okay? So at the end and beginning of every iteration the variables little m and little n contain values whose GCD is the answer that we want. So while the values in M and N change, their GCD remains what we want. So here is our main program. Now the way to prove this is to first see what happens on the very first iteration. So on the very first iteration you can see that we are reading in values capital M and capital N into these variables. So when you enter the iteration, then clearly M and N will have exactly uh, the variables m and n will have exactly the values capital M capital N. So this will be trivially true. Okay? So on the first iteration everything is easy. So um, uh, yeah, so let us worry about the second iteration or in general the ith iteration because we are going to assume that it is true at the beginning of some ith iteration and we are going to prove that it will hold at the end of that ith iteration. Okay? 
So uh, since we have proved that it is true at the beginning of the first iteration, then what if we prove it for general i, the fact that it is true at the beginning of the first iteration will guarantee that it will be true at the end of the first iteration. But being true at the end of the first iteration is the same thing as being true at the beginning of the, of the second iteration. So the fact that it is true at, at the beginning of the second iteration will guarantee that it will be true at the end of the second iteration and so on. So we just have to make this assumption that it is true on the ith entry and from this we have to derive that it must be true on the end of the ith iteration. Okay. So let us see what happens in this iteration. So the next value of m, this next m is going to be n. The next value of n is going to be m mod n. Okay. So note first that by Euclid's theorem, the GCD of the original values in m and n okay, is equal to the next values of m, uh, n and m mod n. Why? Euclid's theorem and Euclid's theorem in the case m mod n is not 0. So why is m mod n not 0? Well, the very fact that we entered over here says that m mod n must not be 0. So by Euclid's theorem, the GCD of these values must be the GCD of the original contents of m and n. Okay? But at the end, what are we doing? We are placing these values inside, inside m and n. So therefore, we have proved that uh, the invariant holds also at the end. Okay? So what we have done? We have proved that uh, the final values of m and n uh, which are these, their GCD is also the same as the original, the GCD of the original values. So we have proved that if the invariant is true at the beginning, the invariant must be true at the end. And therefore we have proved that it must be true at the beginning and end of all iterations. Okay. Now I want to argue that this invariant actually implies that the correct value is printed in this last statement as well. Okay. The correct value is printed over here. Why is that? If the correct value is printed, then control comes over here only from this point. So at this point m mod n must have been equal to 0. But if m mod n must be is equal to 0, then n must divide m. Not only that, n must be a greatest divisor of both little m and little n. But the loop invariant assures us that little m and little n have the same divisor as capital M capital N. Therefore, the divisor, the greatest divisor of little m and little n is exactly the answer that we are looking for and that is the answer that we have printed. Of course, so we have only proved right now that the correct answer is printed if control ever gets to this point. So next we have to argue that the control actually gets to this point. So that is the proof of termination. So again this is our program. and. The key point to be noted over here is that the value of n, the second argument is always going to decrease. Okay? So why is that? So the second, the next value of the second argument is going to be m mod n. Okay? But m mod n is always smaller than n. The remainder when something is divided by n is always smaller than that number. So therefore this second argument value is always going to decrease. Okay? So uh, the second argument value starts off as capital M, it is going to decrease and it is an integer so it decreases at least by 1. And so if n iterations happen, then what would happen? Then this n would become 0, but we know that it does not become 0. Okay? We know that, well we should really prove it, but that is an easy proof, I will let you figure it out, that it never becomes 0. So that means n iterations can never happen. Okay? So that means fewer than n iterations happen or in particular some finite number of iterations happen and this algorithm terminates. All right. So we have argued that not only does the algorithm uh, prove the correct answer if it terminates, but we have also argued that it terminates and therefore we know that it terminates and 
produces the correct answer. Now I would like you to go back and ask yourself what happens if these two were exchanged. You will see that then this termination would not happen because the value of n would not decrease. So just a silly mistake would prevent the termination from happening. This is the answer to the problem that was asked on an earlier slide. Okay, so we have said basically that it terminates and it prints the correct answer and therefore we have proved that uh, it actually terminates and prints the correct answer. So we argued that the program terminates and we also argued that if it terminates it prints the correct answer. So therefore we can say that it uh, terminates and prints the correct answer. Okay? So this is just a writing down of that. So let us summarize. So we claim that in each iteration m and n may change but their GCD does not change. Okay? So essentially this is saying that look we are not losing any information although we are making the number smaller and smaller. Okay? So eventually if we get the GCD at any point that will be the correct value. And we said that in each iteration the second argument reduces but it can never become 0 and uh, uh, therefore uh, since it reduces by at least once the number of iterations has to be smaller than the first value that this variable n takes. Now we had another example of uh, a for loop this time which was the cube table program. Okay? Now you may ask does this idea of proof of correctness invariant, does it apply to the cube table program as well? Okay? So this was our cube table program, it is a rather trivial program. So in the first place its correctness is, is pretty obvious just by looking at it, okay? we do not really, there is, no, there is no real room for confusion over here. But we can write an invariant if we really want and the invariant could be something like this. When iteration i begins cubes until i minus 1 will have been printed. Okay? So that is true and this invariant uh, is actually useful in the sense that it tells us very explicitly what progress we have made until that point. Okay? And the potential we could say is the value of i okay? and that it must increase in every step but cannot increase beyond y. So the potential cannot go beyond i, it starts at 1 and therefore right away we know that there are 100 iterations. So this is this part is rather trivial. Okay, but this part is still somewhat interesting because it is saying what progress we have made until step i. Okay? Yeah, so as I said for such a simple programs invariant seems to make the simple things more complex. Okay? So, so it is not recommended that you should write invariants, but the invariant does say something useful. So you should, you should have it in mind that it does make progress. So while formally an invariant is not needed or but it does say something interesting. Okay, so uh, some concluding remarks. So we have looked at while, do while and for which are the C++ statements that allow you to loop. Repeat allows you to loop but it is not a part of C++, it is a part of simple CPP and we introduced it because it is very easy to understand. But now that you know while, do while, for, you should stop using repeat uh, for one thing because you want to learn the C++ statements and another because the C++ statements are more general and more powerful and they can do things which the repeat cannot do. So, some more concluding remarks, the important issues in writing a loop are ensure that you do not execute iterations indefinitely. Okay. If you cannot terminate the loop using a check at the beginning of the repeated portion, you can either duplicate the code or you can use a break. Okay. So some, some work is needed in order to match the structure of your manual algorithm which might have that condition checking step at different places so that it matches with whatever statements you write. Okay? The remarks that we made in chapter 3 about uh, uh, thinking about the manual algorithm okay, 
making a plan and identifying the general pattern of action apply here also. And uh, uh, in some sense what is happening over here the invariants and uh, the termination are sort of a part of the plan. So when you write a loop you should have something like the invariant or uh, in your mind which is kind of a plan. Okay? Then the actions in the loop may include preparing for the next iteration. Okay? So incrementing the variable or setting new values of m and n as in the G GCD program. So typically uh, the, the, the loop may have some initial values of the variables then maybe you do something with the variables like maybe print them and then you change the values so that they are ready for the next iteration that is they satisfy whatever is invariant is needed for the next iteration. Thinking about invariants and potential is a good thing in the sense that you are checking that your loop is doing the right thing and that it will terminate. Okay? I would suggest that you should write these down when the algorithm is even slightly clever. Okay? You should think to yourself, look am I completely sure that this loop is going to terminate. So for that in, uh, defining something like a potential is a really good idea. And it is a really good idea also to write invariants because they tell you what your program is doing. Okay? So if you make a mistake, if you have a bug, then the invariants and the potential will help you find that bug. So the potential will tell you why is my program not terminating, the invariant might tell you why is, not, why is my program uh, not giving the correct answer. So at some point quite presumably, quite possibly the invariant may be violated by your program. Okay? So you want some, some property to hold but while writing the program you made a silly mistake and that, uh, that property is not holding any longer. Now the proof of learning to program is in writing lots of programs. So at the end of chapter 7 many problems are given. So I will strongly encourage you to uh, write programs corresponding to these to those problems and with that I will conclude this lecture segment. Thank you.